Children, let's just give a warm welcome to my buddy Josh Cole. Kia ora, g'day, howdy, hi, good morning, bula vanaka, talofa lava, namaste, and a big bonjour to you. Uh, it's great to be here. My wife and I, uh, wave Misty, my beautiful wife, Dan, my oldest son in the front row too, Daniel. And we just love this church. Uh, we love this city, this place. Do you call yourself a city or a town? City, of course, yeah. Uh, I thought so. Uh, we love this place and have been coming back for a few years and have really grown to love what God is doing in this place, in this midst. And Jody and Laurie, what heroes, hey? How many of you just love Jody and Laurie? Um, I think consistency and faithfulness is so important. And I see that in Jody and Laurie, the whole staff team here, and what you're laboring for to provide a landing place for the glory of God to come, for His presence to dwell in the midst of His people. How many of you are hungry for the presence of God? And so it is a privilege to be here. And uh, I love this, the, the hospitality of the South too. I have to get back to the gym when I get home. Um, but we are so thrilled to be here and to be able to share a little bit about what we're doing in the South Pacific in New Zealand and working into Fiji. So I'm going to show you a few photos. We've got some slides. You can put up the first one. This is our family. Um, Daniel's our oldest and our youngest uh, daughter is nine, Eden. And then our youngest son, Levi, is three. And he is a rascal <laughs> in the best way possible. So this is our family. We've been serving with Youth of the Mission as full-time volunteers for the last, well, 20 years. Uh, we pioneered a mission base in a city called Tauranga in New Zealand. And uh, for the last 20 years, we have been laboring in prayer and training of young missionaries to send them into the harvest field, into the nations, to make known the name of Jesus, especially where He's not known. And our heart really is for the unreached, for the isolated, for the forgotten, for the marginalised, for the broken, for the hurting and the poor. How many of you think that is the heart of God? And so if you go through, roll through these slides, I'll just tell a few, a little bit of what we're doing. So our work is a little picture of New Zealand. By the way, New Zealand is out of the way of everywhere. You don't go to New Zealand on the way to somewhere, you just go to New Zealand. Uh, how many of you would like to go to New Zealand? Some of you have been, actually, Jack, Jackie, Jacqueline, I don't know if you're in the room, but you were out with us in Fiji earlier. And another one of your own, Lakin, she's out with us and she is doing so well, by the way. But we're working into the remote parts of the South Pacific. And about four years ago, we were given this ship. And this ship has actually enabled us to access places where there's no health care, where there's no access by plane, by car, obviously. Um, and there's about 936 inhabited islands of the South Pacific. Many, you cannot go unless you have a boat. And so we were given this ship and that's our mission field. And this is mostly the forgotten part of the world. And there's many of these islands where communities of people are living and they're living in poverty, they're living in great need. And so God has given us this ship and a strategy to use healthcare to actually open the door for the Gospel to come. And so we've been doing that for the last couple of years. Uh, we've also got a couple of yachts that we use and uh, we, we, that's how we access these islands. And we've seen amazing things happen in Fiji. If you go through, these are the kinds of villages. This was an island we went to just a few months ago and uh, saw amazing things happen here. And uh, this year we were able to deliver four times the amount of health services than we were last year because what happened in March was God opened a door for us to go up to Fiji to meet with the Prime Minister of Fiji and also the High Chief. And how many of you know God loves to open doors for His Gospel to come and for Himself to be made known in these places. And so we've had, in, there's a photo right there in the bottom right of us, a gr small group of us with the Prime Minister of Fiji. We were supposed to have 10 minutes. We had an hour with him, ended up praying for him and prophesying over him at the end of this time. And he's opened up a wide door and signed a 10 year uh, memorandum of understanding with us 
uh, to give us favour to access all of the islands of Fiji without restrictions, even changing some of the policies around immigration so that missionaries can go in. I'm telling you, we're living in an awesome time and God is answering prayer. By the way, prayer is the small hinge that opens big doors. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go on in the message this morning. In 45 minutes, a small dental service can change somebody's life. And we saw this. And then what happens is it changes the family. It changes the community and the whole of a society. In a week or two, you can have such a large impact on just a small village. There's one island we're in called Rambi Island. Actually, just hold, hold on this one just for a little bit. Uh, Rambi Island, which was, is made up mostly of refugees from a place called Kiribati Islands, which is halfway between New Zealand and Hawaii. And anyway, because of the rising ocean levels, they, had, they left, came to Fiji and made their home in Rambi Island. And uh, it happened that the week that the ship was at Rambi Island, that we had a team with the audible Bible in their native language, which is Gilbertese. And we were there and able to let these, this is a picture of these, uh, women hearing the Word of God in Gilbertese for the very first time in their life. Tears just flowing down their cheeks as they're hearing the Scripture in their mother tongue and their language for the first time in their life. And many of them can't read anyway. So to hear the Bible audibly is life-changing for these people. So not just are we offering health services, we're bringing the Bible, we're bringing the Gospel. We saw 40 high school students come to the Lord in the, in the local high school on Rambi Island. We're seeing people healed. We're seeing people delivered. We're seeing people set free. We're seeing whole communities, families changed in Fiji. And we just feel like this is just the beginning. This year, we were able to offer 13,584 health services. That's uh, 13,584 lives that have been changed just because somebody went on a boat. Our philosophy is pretty simple. Hear God, obey and just don't quit. And I think it's a pretty good philosophy to live by. How many of you know it's important to hear the voice of God? How many of you know God speaks? He loves to speak. He's always been speaking and He wants us to hear. We are pre-wired by God to hear His voice and to respond to His voice. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there's a QR code here. If you wanna hear more stories and see videos and testimonies of what God is doing in the South Pacific, Go to the QR code, there's links there to websites and videos and pictures and, and more of what we're doing. If you want more access to what we're doing, and we'll put this up at the end of the service as well. I wanna show you a quick three minute video before we get into the Word of God this morning, just to give you a picture of what it really looks like. Many of you uh, may wanna be involved in some way and you don't know how, but even just prayer is powerful. But you may have skills. We've been praying and God has answered so many prayers over the years. We were praying for an electrician to come and rewire the ship. And guess who turns up on the dock? Some of you will know the name Smith Wigglesworth. Well, it was his grandson, Keith Wigglesworth, turns up on the dock. He's an electrician, he's unsaved, and he ends up rewiring the whole ship. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, labour as well as uh, product to rewire our ship electrically. Amazing how God answers prayer, isn't it? If you don't know that name, Smith Wigglesworth, Google it. He's a healing revivalist. Let's have a look at this video. Reflecting on the past year aboard the YWAM Koha, where our commitment is to empower health in the Pacific, we have seen that mandate lived out in practical ways. This year, the YWAM Koha completed her second year of deployment in Fiji, reaching from the remote Rombi Island in the north to the breathtaking Yasawas in the west. Our guiding principle for these seven outreaches was simple, go again, better. And the outcomes speak volumes. Over 13 weeks, more than 13,000 health services were delivered free of charge, most in villages in the heart of out-of-the-way locations. These beautiful islands have resourceful people living in distant places that tourists rarely see. Their greatest challenges come from extreme isolation. During our five-month deployment, a diverse team of 150 volunteers from nations around the globe joined forces. Mariners, doctors, dentists, cooks, and general volunteers came together 
weaving a dynamic tapestry of healing and hope for the isolated peoples of the Pacific. Due to these efforts, the Fijian government recognized our impact, culminating in the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding with YWAM ships Aotearoa. This agreement helps make the complicated logistics of bringing a ship with supplies and medical and dental professionals into the nation. None of this would be possible without the incredible support of generous organizations and the thousands of individuals who played a vital role in making this deployment a success. As we look ahead, our commitment to Fiji and the Pacific remains unwavering. Partnerships will continue to be the bedrock of everything we do. Together, we will continue to empower health in the isolated communities of the Pacific. Bulagimaka kia ora. I'm on board the YWAM Soha here in uh, Kandavu as the Minister for Women, Children and Poverty and Aviation. I'm very thankful for the support that has been given by YWAM, especially to see our people here in Kandavu who are the most unreachable. This is what our ministry also does, so you're supporting our work. So thank you so much. We love about the level and uh, God bless you in all your efforts. And please do keep coming back as often as you can. So, binaka, I want to say a massive na mihi nui for and thank you so much to all of our funders, our partners, our key stakeholders in Fiji, in New Zealand, our donors, the literal hundreds of people that undergird the activity of YWAM Ships Aotearoa. We couldn't have done it without you. We're so grateful. We feel like we've just got started. We believe the future is so bright, but we want you to know that together, you, and us together we're an empowering a healthy future for the whole pacific god bless so it just gives you a are we on testing one two one two testing one two yellow shirt <laughs> testing there we go we're on okay good that just gives you a quick glimpse of what God is doing in the South Pacific. And again, if you want more information, jump on that QR code at the end of the service. If you want to stay in touch, you want to be uh, receiving testimonies and reports, jump on that. But I'm telling you, miraculous things are taking place in our part of the world. Well, I want to talk this morning and carry on this series about effective principles in prayer. Prayer is amazing. I feel like my story in prayer started this way. I think the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had a conversation and thought, well, who can we pick from the most isolated part of the world who doesn't really like prayer and we could raise them up to love prayer and call everyone else to it? I feel like Holy Spirit said, I know exactly the guy, his name's Josh Cole and he lives in New Zealand. <laughs> and I feel like that's been my story in prayer. And I've learned that uh, prayer is one of the great or the great privilege of being a believer. It's not just something that we do, it's something that we become, it's something that we are, it's the designed principle that God has given us to walk with Him in deep intimacy, to partner with Him and to see His Kingdom come here on the earth. How many of you want His Kingdom here on the earth? I wanna speak about two different passages this morning that has to do with this idea of persistence or unrelenting prayer or enduring prayer, you might say. And the first is in Luke chapter 11. And then I wanna talk a little bit, it's interesting, Daniel, uh, uh, Jody mentioned the name Daniel this morning. I was asking my son, Daniel, who should I speak on this morning? He said, Daniel, of course. And so I wanna speak out of Daniel chapter six, uh, some principles from his life, his life of prayer as well. And I believe the Lord is putting a passion in our heart for some of the foundational aspects of what it means to be a believer or a follower of Jesus. And by the way, the foundational aspects of prayer, of fasting, of giving, of loving your neighbour, of loving God, that, that is deep Christianity, by the way. That's real Christianity. Sometimes that we think that we can mature out of the simple things of the faith or the seemingly simple things of the faith. I wanna tell you this morning, we never graduate out of the simplicity of a prayer life. Even in the age to come, guess what the vehicle is? Prayer. It's the designed vehicle. But it's wild how in our lives, so quickly prayer can fade. 
we can become so busy with all the things going on and our prayer life can begin to dwindle. But I wanna tell you, prayer is powerful. It's the place that we have the most influence is to the highest government in all of created order where our voice is heard. Revelation chapter five says that our, our prayers are like incense that go up before Him and He has bowls full of incense, which is the prayers of the saints. Do you know when you pray, this frequency of your voice, the sound of your voice, it actually goes somewhere. You don't pray to a room. You don't pray to a man or a friend or someone next to you or someone in the circle or someone around a dinner table. When you pray, your voice, no matter how weak, no matter how loud, no matter how quiet, your voice actually goes somewhere. It ascends beyond this temporal realm to, to the unseen realm, to the place where God dwells and your voice is heard in the courts of heaven. Come on, somebody. I mean, why wouldn't you love prayer if you knew that the most glorious, the most beautiful, the most loving being in all of created order, the one who created all things, He heard every phrase that came out of your mouth. But we get so busy with friends and we can become very shallow with God. We easily fill our day with all kinds of things no matter how important it is, and it can fade very quickly when it comes to thinking about prayer or even doing prayer. In the early church, it was very simple, and guess what? It worked. Prayer was powerful. Why do we ever try to change that or fix that? Here's what they did. They waited on God, they ministered to Him, they worshipped Him, they prayed, then they laid hands on and sent people out. It was pretty simple. Well, Jesus, He had a prayer life. In fact, in Hebrews 7, verse 25, it says this, Therefore He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Since He always, one version says, forever lives to make intercession for them. Romans 8 verse 34 puts it this way. It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. I wanna tell you that heaven is in your corner. Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, is at the right hand of the Father and He is praying. Some people think, well, what is Jesus doing? Is He just waiting to come back? Is He just sitting in a lazy boy, flicking the channel? I don't, what, what's He doing right now? Do you know, for the last 2,000 years, He's had a full-time job. And His job is prayer. And He's been praying and He's been praying for you. Right now, there is a six foot Jewish man in a resurrected glorified body. I don't know if he's six foot, but Jody's about six foot. And He is seated at the right hand of the Father and He is praying. He is praying for what? For you and I. This is amazing. I have full confidence that what He started with you, He is able to bring it forth to the fullness of completion. Why? He's a man of prayer. He who justified you in the courtroom of heaven is the same God who was able to sanctify you completely. You were saved, you are being saved and you will be saved. Why? Prayer. Every person in this room is a testament that prayer works. Your life is an answer to prayer. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody opened a door for you by getting down on their knees and their voice going before the courtroom of heaven. It's good for us to not forget where we came from. And things are shifting for you right now. You're not addicted to the things that you used to be addicted to. You're not looking at the things that you used to look at. Your temper has changed. You, you don't go to the places that you used to go to. Why? Because there's a man at the right hand of the Father and He is praying for you. He's praying you through. I, I tell you, whatever season you're in, I'm telling you, prayer works, just hold on. But sometimes it takes persistence. 
What does it mean that he is at the right hand praying for us? What does that actually look like? Well, I think it's three things. I think just the fact that Jesus is there in a human resurrected body is prayer in and of itself. You have a human advocating for you in the very courtroom of heaven. He's a man. He's fully man, but He's God. And He's there, just His presence before Abba Father. That in and of itself is prayer. His blood, His blood that He shed at Calvary is speaking and it's still speaking. And how many of you know the blood of Jesus speaks a better word? It speaks a better word than disease. It speaks a better word than financial crisis. The blood of Jesus, it speaks a better word than relational conflicts. It speaks a better word than breakdown and disease and sickness. The blood of Jesus, it speaks and it speaks real loud. How many of you know we have victory through His blood? It's the name of this church, victory. You have victory, why? Because of the blood that was shed at the cross. And the third way that Jesus makes intercession is is that He uses words, He speaks. He's speaking your name before the Father, even right now. You don't stand a chance, by the way. (laughs) You got 6,000 years of the saints praying for your generation. (laughs) You got God who became a man, hung on a tree, which is the greatest act of intercession, by the way, died, rose again on the third day and ascended to the right hand of the Father. Then He poured out His Spirit and you got a whole generation of of people praying. By the way, I've been around the world and I'm seeing that some people tell me, they say, well, young people don't really like prayer. I'm saying, I don't know what prayer meetings you're in, but I'm telling you, young people love prayer. They love the presence of God and they love coming before Him. In Mark chapter 1, verse 29, it says this, that the sun was setting and the whole city gathered at the door. And in the morning, Jesus, He departed to a solitary place and there He prayed. So revival is breaking out. God is pouring out His Spirit. The, the, the sick are being healed. And you know what? At the height, when we would set up new Instagram accounts and we'd have another conference and expand buildings. You know what Jesus did at the height of His momentum of His ministry? He withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. Why? Because the demands of the people didn't satisfy Him. That's not what, where He got His identity. It was His voice being heard by His Father in heaven. He knew that it was the affection of His Father that that was what gave Him His, his, his sense of satisfaction, a sense of identity. Jesus lived in prayer. He lived in prayer. He moved in prayer right before Lazarus was raised from the dead. He prayed, He said, Father, thank You that You hear my voice. In Hebrews 5 verse 7, it says that He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. He was heard because of His reverent submission. He prayed before Gethsemane. He prayed in Gethsemane before He went to the cross and He prayed on the cross. He prayed in joy. He prayed in pain. He prayed in His resurrected body before He ascended to glory. He prayed to see that His will was brought under His Father's. He didn't just pray, He taught on prayer. He preached on prayer. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer? In Luke chapter 11, the disciples worked out that Jesus had a little special source on His life. And so they said, Jesus, we've worked it out, teach us to pray. And so He gives them the Lord's Prayer, but then, After teaching them what to pray, then He puts off the teacher's hat and He puts on the coach's hat. Let's have a look at how He coached them in prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verse five, right after the Lord's prayer, He said this. He said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come on to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And He will answer from within and say, do not trouble me, the door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give to you, but I say to you, though He will not rise and give to Him because He is His friend, yet, check this out, because of His persistence, He will rise and give Him as many as He needs. 
So Jesus now has the coach hat and He says, check this out. Imagine this, okay? Just imagine in your life. Imagine that it's 11.45 p.m. one night and you have a friend that rolls up to your door unexpected. And of course, in the South, you open the door and you wanna feed them. They're sitting at the table, you go to the pantry, there's no bread and you go, "Uh uh-oh, what am I gonna feed my friend? You have an idea. I'm gonna go to my neighbour because tonight, I was at their place, I had dinner, I saw the wife put the three loaves of bread into the pantry after dinner as leftovers. So you say to your friend sitting at the table, hold on a sec, I'll be right back. You go next door, walk up the path, knock on the door, no answer, it's now midnight. You're knocking on the door, you're like, hey buddy, open it up. Finally, your friend cracks the window, pulls the curtain back, it's like, Jody, what are you doing here? It's midnight. Hey, Jody, I saw Laurie put the three loaves of bread in the pantry after dinner tonight. Hey, can you just real quick go get the three loaves and bring them to me? You gotta be kidding me. The kids are asleep. How many of you know when the kids are sleeping? Let the kids sleep. <laughs> it's midnight. Hey, I'll tell you what. Jody, I'll, here's the deal. I'll get you some bread at about 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh Uh-uh, I need bread now. This is the parable that Jesus has teaching us and coaching us how to pray. He has us at our friend's place, knocking on the door at midnight, refusing to leave until we get the bread. That's exactly, is that the parable you're reading? Because that's the parable I'm reading. This is right after the Lord's Prayer, by the way. Two words, midnight and persistence. Midnight means it's inconvenient. In fact, I'm telling you, if you just go ahead and try it tonight, just go to your neighbours and just stand at the door and just keep knocking at 12 o'clock. And when they tell you to get off their property, probably with a shotgun in their hand, and you refuse to leave and you stay there, we got words for that kind of stuff, like trespassing, disturbing the peace, breaking the law. Just try it. Does Jesus have us breaking the law to get three loaves of bread? I don't know, maybe. Here's the deal. In this parable, the key word is friendship. Friendship. If you miss that, you miss the whole thing. How many of you know friends can ask friends for things that you can't ask strangers? I'm telling you, you want to get a friendship with God now so that when an inconvenient moment hits, maybe a crisis, maybe some kind of situation where you need a breakthrough from heaven, where you've tried everything, you want a track record, a friendship with God so that when you go and knock on the door of heaven, you've got leverage, you've got relational equity, you've got a bank account that's filled with hours of prayer where your voice is known and your voice is heard. Don't wait until the crisis hits. Start today. It's free. You can do it anywhere. It's just your weak voice before heaven and it changes things. And Jesus goes, well, it wasn't even actually because of the friendship. It's just because of the persistence. You just refused to leave. You just didn't quit. You just stayed there. Well, friendship changes everything. How many of you know when you're a friend, you go to their house, your friend's house. If you're a real friend, you just go straight to the fridge. <laughs> if, you're, if you're like acquaintances, kind of like, how do I act? What would, my, what would they think if I went to the fridge? I'm telling you, you want relational equity with God, friendship with God. How many of you know Jesus' mother, Mary? How many of you know a mother has incredible relational leverage with the son? I push you out into this world. 
I fed you, I changed you, I raised you. So John chapter two, they run out of wine at the wedding and mum goes to the son, hey, Jesus, uh, wine's out. And everyone knows Jesus only does what the Father is doing and says what the Father's saying, right? So Jesus goes, hold on, mum. Hey, dad, uh, mum says they're out of wine. What do you reckon? <laughs> dad goes, don't do it, Jesus, don't do it. <laughs> if you do it, the cat's out of the bag. Jesus goes to mum, mum, dad said no. What he actually said is my hour has not yet come. Well, mom turns to the servants and says, he's gonna do it. <laughs> you watch, just do what he says. Next minute, wine. I'm telling you, relational leverage is everything. Equity with God, friendship with God. But it takes persistence. Let's have a look real quick at the life of Daniel. In Daniel chapter six, we see Here's Daniel who has been in exile, probably was 12 or 13 years old when he went into exile. He would have known the, the Torah. He would have known the prophecies. Jeremiah said, you've got 70 years in exile. So here he is and he's under three demonic kings, possibly even four. And it's, it, the, the, it, the, these are demonized kings. And here is Daniel and his buddies under this, this, this heavy oppressive government of the day. And like Jody said earlier in the service, they held the line on truth. They swam upstream. They didn't float downstream with the rest of society. They swam against the tide and held the line on truth. And what happened was uh, Darius, King Darius issues a decree and he says, everyone has to worship me, right? And Daniel, look at Daniel chapter six, just for a moment. And I want you to just think about this just for a minute this morning. In Daniel chapter six, verse 10, it says, Daniel knew that the writing was signed. This is the decree. He went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, check this out. Daniel, it says, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God. Check this out. As was his custom since the early days of his youth. Daniel's like, well, I've been doing it my whole life. By the way, he's in his early 80s. How many of you love the story of Daniel and the lion's den? Do you know he is like 85 years old? And it says that he prayed as he did in his early days. Well, it's a good of any day to die. I'm just gonna keep doing what I know is right. He opens the window and he gets down on his knees. He's not hiding. 68 years or so of relational equity with God, three times a day, it says, as he did in his youth. Do you know that's about 75,000 set aside prayers, times of prayer in Daniel's life that led to this moment? On average, 68 years, three times a day. We're talking grooves on the floorboards. I mean, picture your 85 year old grandpa on his knees doing what he's done his whole life. What would happen if we saw a generation commit to God in prayer like Daniel did? No matter what's happening in our nation, no matter what's happening in our workplace, our family, in society, in Sulphur, Louisiana, what we see in the physical, in the natural realm, no matter what's going on, here's what we do. We get on our knees. And I don't think you have to actually get on your knees, although sometimes body language is important. It's the, it's the position of the heart that's most important and you come before God. Here's Daniel's prayer. God, I thank You. Psalm 100, we enter His courts, his, we enter His gates with thanksgiving. God, I thank You for who You are today. Here's the second part, because thanksgiving always leads to this. God, I love You. And then the third part is, God, I need You. 
If you can just remember those three things. God, I thank You. God, I love You. And God, I need You. It doesn't start with the need first. It starts with thanksgiving. No matter what you've got going on in your life, here's what you've got. Breath in your lungs and blood in your veins. God, I thank You for the gift of life. And God, I love You. You're everything to me. And God, I need You. I'm desperate for You. I need an intervention in my life. Three times a day in a demonic kingdom. Wow, that's the kind of faithfulness and prayer I think God is wanting to forge in a whole generation. So the king comes after he had been told about Daniel praying and he's distressed and he throws him into the lion's den. And he says to to Daniel, may the God who you serve continually, may He rescue and save you. How many of you know Daniel had a prayer life that was continual? This is the word I've been praying this morning for Victory Worship Centre is, God, would they be a people of continually, continually, enduring, of persistence? Daniel's in the lion's den and God rescues him. The next morning the king comes and how many of you know Daniel probably had every reason to be a little bit mad at the king. And do you know what Daniel's response was to the king? The first thing out of his mouth in Daniel 6 verse 21, he said, O king, live forever. Daniel had an unoffended heart even because of mistreatment, even being dishonoured, even being put to death He had an unoffended heart. Church, I I believe that in prayer, that's the way that we forge this unoffended heart that we've got to learn to live with. Man, if we could turn our criticism into prayer, if we could turn our cynicism into prayer, if we could turn our gossip into prayer, I think God would begin to pour out His Spirit like He never has before. I think we'd begin to see breakthroughs that we've never seen before. We've got to turn our heart that's of flesh, uh, of stone into a heart of flesh. The only way to do that is to let your voice come before the courtroom of heaven. God spared Daniel and the king said, In in verse 25, he wrote, to all peoples, to the whole world, he said, I make a new decree that in every dominion, people must tremble and fear the God of Daniel. For He is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one that shall not be destroyed and His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and He rescues and He works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Look at this, a demonically motivated king now reverses his decree and makes one of the most profound statements that we even sing songs about, about the nature and the character of God. Here's the statement. He rescues and He saves. He works wonders and He does signs. He's a miraculous working God. And I believe even this morning, God wants to work miracles in this room. Do you believe that? Here's the hinge that opens the door. It's called prayer. It's really simple actually. It's just talking to God. Sometimes it's waiting on Him. Sometimes it's positioning your heart. And I wanna encourage you this morning to set your heart and go, God, I wanna be like Daniel. I wanna forge a life of intimacy with you. It doesn't have to be three times a day, it could be five. It could be two, it could be one. It could be washing the dishes. God, I thank You this morning. Your mercy endures forever. It could be driving your kids to school. God, I love You. You're everything to me. It could be at the office, sitting in front of that computer thinking, how am I gonna do this? I just don't even wanna be here. God, I need You today. Your grace is sufficient. I'm telling you this morning, we just position our hearts. We say, God, help us. I wanna be a person of prayer. I wanna be a woman of prayer. I want my family to be a family of prayer. We're gonna pray together. It might not be pretty. It might be early in the morning, crusties in the eyes, not looking that great, but just coming before the courtroom of heaven. God, I need You. God, I love You. God, I thank You.